I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Professor Tim O'Brien, who has been working for many, many years in the world of well-being. Uh, many years. Uh, one of the favourite people I talk to, and when we've had conversations in the past, Tim, we've had a cup of tea and we've made it last for about four and a half hours. And we've done that several times, haven't we, Tim, actually? So we're going to be, I've been warned many times, actually, to keep an eye on my watch today. Uh, I've got a watch and you've got yours as well, so we're both going to keep an eye out. Um, Tim, it's, it's so exciting to have you here. I'm, I'm, I'm literally so excited to be speaking to uh, Professor Tim, who is going to share some insight into the world of well-being, what it is, what it means, uh, and why it's so important in this profession. But Tim, do you mind uh, perhaps just beginning by just sharing um, just a little insight into your professional background and your, and your career so far, if that's okay? Yeah, of course. I hope uh, people can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Um, if it doesn't appear patronising, before I do that, would it be okay if I said thank you to all of the uh, leaders, um, senior leaders, teachers, for what they've done during the pandemic, those in the UK and beyond who are here today? Uh, sometimes it sounds patronising when someone who doesn't do your job tells you you're great at your job. Mm. But um, I want to thank them for repurposing education and um, redefining it and reconstructing it even. And also... Um, I'd like, and serving their communities in the way that they have, for the people who've gone in to do that and taken risk, and also for the people who've done the right thing and stayed at home if they've got people in their families who are at risk. So um, I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you, really. Um, my, my, my career, I'll be quick because it's quite varied. Uh, I started as a teacher in, in mainstream education in a comprehensive school. Uh, then I did an advanced diploma in psychology and severe learning difficulties and I worked with children with severe learning difficulties with profound and multiple learning difficulties. Uh, then I was appointed to help turn around. Um, in, the, in those days it was an EBD school, age 4 to 16, uh, and the uh, Ofsted language, if you weren't, uh, if you were now in special measures, then it was failing. Uh, so it was a failing school and all of the difficulties around uh, the culture of people feeling that they're failing. Uh, when the school's been told it's failing. Um, when that school was in a great place, a whole team of people, absolutely everybody, made it happen. Uh, I took a post as a senior lecturer at Westminster College, Oxford. Uh, then I decided to make a change in my career. I had a PhD in psychology, and I went to work in psychology in different environments. So I worked for three Premier League football teams as a first team psychologist. I did things like write um, an emerging leaders program for Nike. I know everybody, there'll be many leaders here today. Everybody's an emerging leader, obviously. You've never finished article, but that was more like, in education, it'd be a bit more like people moving into middle management and middle lead, uh, leaders. Uh, what else did I do? wrote um, a psychology of leadership program for Red Bull and things like this. Uh, always remained in touch with education as a governor, as an SEND governor. Um, gosh, done a variety of things, then came back. Thank you. Uh, I worked for Arsenal for 10 years, for example as their first team psychologist. Uh, when oh, Arsenal not the goalkeeper, not the goalkeeper then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stop it. And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, well, that's when Arsene Wenger was manager. Then I came back to work in education. So I work now um, at UCL, mainly in research. I don't know if you'll ask me later about some of the research. In, in yeah, well, we yeah we'll come on to that. Yeah, yeah so I work yeah. in that. And, uh, and I do some work part-time at, um, MIC at the University of Limerick in Ireland, where we've just launched a master's in the leadership of well-being in education. So wow. quite an innovative wow. uh, master's, yeah. So I tend to now do quite a lot of research working with schools. So the last thing well, I'll I'm... say on it, if it's okay, is that I'm a researcher who doesn't believe in particularly academics coming to disseminate research onto schools. Um, uh, I like to work on knowledge exchange programs, really, where we work alongside schools, head teachers, teachers, learning support assistants, teaching assistants have their own ideas. We have ideas and we, we work together on uh, making things better. So that's a sort of potted history of me. Well, that's it's fascinating, Tim. I mean, thank you for, for reducing. I mean, that's like pouring the ocean into a bucket, but you managed it. So um, you've, we, we, we approached you and we were really keen, really keen for you to write 
co-author the Pathway Wellbeing Programme with, uh, with your writing partner, Dr. Dennis Guiney. Um, can you, so I, I wouldn't mind actually if you could just tell us something a little bit more about your, your, your research in the field of well-being and perhaps, perhaps in, a, in a different order, tell us really what, what we mean by the phrase well-being because it's much misinterpreted sometimes. Okay, start with the easy questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what, <laughs> what do we mean by well-being? Well, uh, pe some people talk about well-being when they're actually talking about welfare. Some people talk about well-being when they're actually talking yeah. about wellness. Uh, to know what something is, particularly a construct or a concept, you have to be able to define it. You have to be able yeah. to describe it and understand how it's played out in the real world uh, so you can uh, change it. And there's no really agreed universal definition of well-being. It's one of the problems. I mean, there's even arguments about how to spell it. So I noticed in the break when you were showing your slides, you spell well-being with, an hyph with a hyphen. I don't spell it with a hyphen. Some, some people have inverted, you know, all of these things have meaning. I won't bore you with it, but they all have meaning. So it's a complex construct. But one of the issues or contentious issues about it is can you measure it? And schools are often interested in that. So if I want to know about the well-being of my staff, can I measure it? So uh, at the moment, uh, let's think of an example. UK government's a good example. They have 43, um, they measure national well-being every year, 43 indicators. Uh, the last data was in March 2019. Uh, and for example, uh, obviously this before the tragic time and challenging time we're in now, but for example, happiness and life satisfaction went up in one area of the UK particularly, that was the Northwest. Um, anxiety in the UK has gone down. Um, life satisfaction has gone up. Uh, although actually I say that anxiety in Northern Ireland has gone up slightly. Um, most indicators are positive or neutral. I think there's two or three indicators that are negative in terms of our well-being. So we trust politicians less than we used to the year before. And we go to less cultural activities. Now I, I say that, because there are lots of scales for measuring well-being, right? And there'll be some people screaming at the screen saying, I'm not happier. I've got, you know, look at my job and look at my work. But yeah. uh, it's just one way of looking that you can measure well-being. And there are many scales for doing it, the Warwick Edinburgh scale, there's multiple scales that are used, usually for large populations. Um, and then if I could just say over the other side here, we have people who say it is, uh, it's ludicrous to try and measure well-being. Uh, how can you do that? It's so subjective to each individual. How can, it's like nailing jelly to a stick. How can you do it? You can't do it. It changes across context, it's, and it's certainly different in different cultures, how well-being is conceptualised. So, so, so what yeah. do you... We've gone off script already, I'm quite pleased. What do you think... Oh, I'm about to. What do you think people mean when they say the well-being of teachers is important and well-being is something that isn't that perhaps has been ignored a bit and now we need what do we actually mean by that okay well there's two things we don't re yeah. we don't really know whether there's such a thing as teacher well-being right uh, in that it's qualitatively different from any other job uh, and some of the research we've done with teachers we say what is teacher well-being that's so special to teachers and then they list lots of things and we say isn't that junior doctor well-being isn't that bus driver well-being you know, we don't really know both Dennis and I have done a lot of work on this, and we think we are actually, because in the literature it says that there probably isn't a well-being special to teachers, but we think we may have got there and found something. So that's the answer to the question about teacher well-being. Uh, about what do we mean? Generally, it, 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 gen it plays out in a sort of polarised way, really. So, and and that, it does that in the literature as well, interestingly. In our work with teachers, it does. So some people are looking for... So if you look at well-being as... Um, uh, the absence of pain and the presence of pleasure or happiness. And so therefore, the less pain you have in your life, the more happiness you have in your life, or you're, if you're lucky enough, the more joy you have in your life, then you could say your well-being is however you want to do it, higher, more robust, however you might describe it. Um, that's problematic, uh, problematic because as a sustained model of well-being, you can't always be happy. And if you meet someone who's 24 seven happy, that can be a bit of a challenge sometimes. Um, the other way of framing it is uh, in a sort of eudaimonic way, really, which more, um, how would I describe that? More as having a good spirit, uh, well living, if you like. So living according to your values, but critically having meaning and purpose in your life. 
Um, and it's interesting what you know, we, we mentioned when I used to work in SEMH as it is now in that environment. Um, your meaning and purpose, you have to remember it. You know, you're working with your, you're working in a situation where people are abusive and physically threatening. That's just in the staff room. Oh, joke, sorry. But, you know, you work with people who are abusive, threatening, it's challenging. Uh, you meet six year olds that can de skill you in a second as a teacher. They can run rings around you sometimes. And you think, I can't do this, or how, why have I gone into this? Uh, and you're not going to be happy and you might well be stressed. But if you remember your meaning and purpose and why you're there, your well being might be okay, actually. Wow. It's just, it's, it's, it's so fascinating because it's so difficult to interpret and people will interpret it in their own different ways but we kind of all know that something needs addressing and something needs needs doing say, about it and we'll perhaps come can, on can I, yeah of what, course please do what yeah you just said there is that okay Andrew? just to because I, i'm a big believer certainly in the work that we've done with schools that you should interpret it in a localized way that's the way to do it because ed right. education sometimes if you think of um concepts like inclusion uh, and so you ha you get models of inclusion, for example, and it's a once you know it's a, it's a cliche now, but it's a one size fits all model, or, or a one size fits nobody model sometimes, to be honest. But um, if you get um, this sort of one size fits all approach to well being, particularly if you conceptualise well being as well being and mental health together, and you conceptualise well being that way, it can be problematic really because well being. Uh, when we uh, were running a teacher wellbeing program a few years ago, I remember speaking to a head in a special school in the south of England, um, and well-being in his school, where when you do your job as a head teacher and as a teacher, you start the year with your register of young people, and sadly, some of those young people are life limited, and you know that some would have passed away by the end of the year. Well-being means something to him that it might not yeah. mean in a, it'll be different. I'm not saying it, in a, in, a, in a different school. So. I'm very much in favour of work, the work, working with schools on localised school understandings of what well-being is. Well, it's, I couldn't agree more. I think that's so fascinating. And you're right actually to indicate that that's OK if people interpret it in different ways, yeah. because that's right and proper that they do. Um, and as you say, it isn't a one-size-fits-all by any means. Um, I, 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 before I come on to the next question, I just, I just want to remind people that you're, you're welcome to ask questions. Please do. We're going to have some time at the end to ask questions of Tim. Um, I've got so many questions, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to use any of my questions. Uh, please, please, please uh, uh, send us your questions for Tim, and we'll have some time at the end. Tim, I've got to, I can't let it go. I've got to, I've got to come back to, you mentioned um, that you were a team psychologist for some Premier League football clubs. Yep. For 10 years, in fact. I know there's a particular uh, club in London you were assigned to, um, and I, I, I'm just intrigued. What what lessons do you think you may have learned there that, that schools could use? What are the parallels there? Are there are there some lessons that come out of your work with with those clubs that might be relevant? That's a good question. So what's going on in schools? That's a very good question. Uh, well, the first thing that springs to mind in terms of well-being is that in elite sport um, you cannot perform unless you follow a particular model, which is um, perform, recover, perform. You can't just keep oh. performing. So in elite oh. sport, you have people who they will perform um, and then they will have a physical and psychological recovery period. And some of that will be working with a psychologist because they may have things on their mind that have concerned them about their performance, but they may have things on their mind when they live in, the, you know, like everybody, they have a life. Uh, in their life that's concerning them and then they perform again and um, I mean I think education a fair, you know obviously in the current context it's challenging but uh, can learn a lot from that really that people have to teachers leaders have to have a life they can't just fully commit to their job it's one of the things about pathway that as you know I really like that it's personal and professional you have to have a life uh, what else might come to mind? So when I've worked with teams, ah, now I sound like I'm about to promote a book, which you know me, I'm, I'm not going to do that, but I've written some academic, <laughs> I, I wrote a book a while ago called Inner Story. I know uh, later on that Ruth's going to talk about Inner Voice, but, uh, and it's not really an academic book. It's not one of those reference books. It looks at how the inner narrative in your mind uh, about who you think you are 
and how it affects how you feel and you think and you behave personally and professionally. And um, I wrote a book about that, how that plays out in terms of your confidence, in terms of leadership, in terms of, but individuals have them, but also teams and organizations have an, an inner narrative. Yeah. Uh, and when I worked in sport, obviously I won't break any confidences, but uh, every year and sometimes uh, regularly, we would create our inner narrative, which really is what does it mean to be in this team? And you know, how honest do you want me to be? Do you want me to be really honest? So some, sometimes it really surprises me uh, that I might talk to people who are uh, leading maybe academies or uh, lot, 10 schools or three schools or 20 schools. Um, and this work is critical to well-being and performance, uh, uh, how people uh, show yeah. up and how they perform as well as how they um, feel and how they deal with things. And, um, and they haven't really done that work. So school here has what I would call an inner story. A school here has an inner story. A school here has a different one. That's fine, but you need to have some consistency about what it means to be. Uh, and one of the things I'll say, which I won't go into, is that when you work at that level, people know a lot about what the research is saying and suggesting about higher performing teams and what the key factors are that make a team perform well. So many things that struck me there. I mean, we, we need hours and hours, but one of the most powerful things that you said there, which has really got me thinking, was you said teachers have to have a life. They have to have a life. And one of the lessons that we could learn from the work you did with those Premier Football teams is that the, the model of perform, recover, perform, recover. And that recover, and contrary to popular, popular belief, I don't believe that enough of that recovery happens in the holidays because I've never met a teacher yet that can't stop dabbling and back into the classroom, thinking about plans, thinking about schemes of work. I, I, so I had 21 years and I, I finished, um, well, temporarily, I, ho I hope very much to continue at some stage, but to 21 years until August last year uh, uh, in headship and teaching. And the reason I mention that is this, and this is going to sound awfully sad, um, but I, we looked, I don't know why we were doing it, but we looked over some family photos. That's right, I think we changed computer or something and we wanted to make sure we got a digital archive of all our family photos. And we looked at some holiday snaps, Tim. And I'm in the photo, I'm there on location with my family. I've got no recollection of it at all. Oh, okay, right. And, um, and that's something that I'm, I'm concerned about. And that was right through the 21 years of teaching. <laughs> How do, we, how do we help, how do we, sorry, encourage ourselves, help ourselves to be there? Do you know what I mean? To be there, not just in body. Okay, so... Um, then maybe well, that's a too personal well, question, but... No, 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 I'm very happy to answer. You're not I'll, alone. The first thing I'll say is that um, uh, if you don't do the job, if you're a person externally, like uh, maybe a parent even, um, and you, you don't do the job, you have no idea about the emotional labour involved in teaching. No, it's huge. It, is, huge. It, it, it can be exhausting. So you have to be really aware. Um, uh, I think Ruth said something about energy being involved. Yeah. Oh, no, it was you, Andrew, that said something about yeah. energy. And um, you have to be able to manage your energy and manage your time. You don't have to just manage your time. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to be able to manage your energy um another thing i'd say as well but well, that's like a very personal thing for people you have to know new, you at your best and, and you at your worst and you have to, to be, be cognizant of that being being more yeah, aware you know, of that we have to so know you it. can keep a check on it you have to know it you have to be able to say when i'm at my best i'm doing these things when i'm at my worst i'm doing these things then you start to notice hang on a second i'm veering over here and I might need to do something about that and this is um, another thing I'd say uh, and, and thank, thankfully the stigma is sort of being reduced around this but whoever you are and it's a cliche that leaders it can be a very lonely job search for a network of support have a network of support yeah completely agree and, and do you see do you recognize this in the teachers that you speak to all the time that some um, may not place their own welfare and their own well-being highly enough and that their default setting that it's about the children in the end can can sometimes cause you problems and that it's not a self-indulgence to say i'm actually going to try and become more cognizant of my own well-being now my own welfare do you know yeah, what i mean it, it seems to me that um in relation to that that you the phrase work-life balance is very unhelpful because uh, work right. is the first Why do you work is the first thing you say my work life balance 
I mean, you could call it life work balance, but I'm very, very interested in, in the balance part of it and in the work that Dennis Carney and I are doing with teachers, which we've been doing for years and we still haven't written up because we haven't fully understood it. But one of the things that happens is teachers talk about um, they, when they feel unbalanced, they know that there's an issue with their well-being. And that could be unbalanced. I remember an art teacher talking to me about saying, sometimes you get told you need, it was an MQT, you get told you have to teach this way. And it threw me off kilter. And I felt unbalanced. Sometimes pressure and stress uh, make you feel unbalanced. But I think people need to work out what does sort of balance and equilibrium psychologically, emotionally, mm. what does that mean for you? And because for example, uh, there might be things, Andrew, I might work with you and things that you might find are uh, put you under pressure to me, m make me stressed. Uh, and you can't project your, well, you might, but I wouldn't want you to project your model of pressure and stress onto me and not understand yeah. that uh, this is me under stress, not under pressure. Because if that's the case, even though people say, my door's always open, I won't come in because you won't understand what's going on inside my mind so it's just fascinating there's there's a phrase that i'd quite like to put to you tim just to i would love to get your ideas on this which is that um this business of hyper accountability at the moment oh yeah okay and how briefly perhaps we can navigate our way through that level of scrutiny at the moment which can be so damaging to our own self-confidence well agency has been talked about a lot yeah actually. and um i think i have very strong views on the normalization of hyper accountability uh that i've often spoken about or written about um having been in that position uh for me what's happened is it's, the system seems to have altered and put pressures onto schools they're sort of league tables i mean very obvious points really but um the over scrutinizing, the deprofessionalizing of the profession, years of um, change, enforced change without consultation, reducing and removing agency, in some cases, devastating agency. And I think there's something about reclaiming some of that. And uh, I'm, I'm a member of, uh, I was a member of the um, DFE expert advisory group on wellbeing. Uh, and you, obviously I can't talk about the confidential nature of that group. But uh, the department were made aware by some people that this has to stop at some point. It has to stop where teachers are under so much, you've got head teachers. I used to work in football. They're like football managers. A few results don't go right and we'll move you on and we'll do something else. Gran granular data affects what education is. It, I, I thought someone said something earlier and, and I, I think that was Ruth, but we have to look at the deeper purpose of what education is. I think it's time for some people to stand up and say, this has to stop. Well, we've heard, haven't we? And this was something that Ruth was saying to me, actually, and I'm sure we'll pick up on it this afternoon, this notion that we, people are falling behind, staff may fall behind, children may fall behind, and I'm very sensitive and sympathetic to that. But fall behind whom? Mm. Because we're all, we're all behind at the moment, if you see what I mean. And there is, there is that notion, perhaps, that, um, particularly from a teaching point of view, that certainly through my career, I always had that overwhelming feeling that I was falling behind something, or I, I hadn't done enough, or what I was doing wasn't good enough. <laughs> and I don't know how we, we get rid of that guilt that we sometimes feel. Maybe this is just me, but I don't think it is. I don't think I'm alone in that. That feeling of, um, I really need to do better than I'm doing, or I'm about to fall behind. You know, there's that constant sense of looking over your shoulder yeah. and the inability to relax. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's something about being in a job where you feel like you're justifying that you can do your job rather than being... Yeah, being that's the kind of that, that type of feeling where assessment feels like it's really about... Look, I'm in yeah. favour of accountability. We have to work out not just in terms of safeguarding but who's trustworthy and who's not trustworthy of course but when it goes hyper i think the impact on well-being and mental health is worrying completely um tim thank you so much uh for 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 the answers and things we we could go on and on all day and uh, i hope very much that we can do another webinar sometime where we can we can have you for for 
for more than an hour but we've got a couple of questions um which if we've got time just a quick couple if that's okay again neither of us neither of us know what's coming so um so we have one here right this is interesting in my school all staff well-being seems directly affected by their own perception of the slt trust and value in them well that's interesting so the level to which the slt trusts and values them seems inextricably linked to their own well-being do you have any advice around this that's an interesting okay one. so uh, that's a, i now sound like one of the uh, government government ministers at a press briefing i was about to say that's a great question thank you for <laughs> um yeah. it, well uh, when dennis guy and i ran a teacher well-being program which was a um uh, day one was looking a lot about what well-being is and is not and these sorts of things and in between day one and day two six weeks later uh, there is a, a piece of action research one teacher uh, raised this as an issue for her so she was two years into the profession and she said um, I'm my well-being is completely affected now there's a couple of things about feedback system uh, and people letting you know that you're good at your job and, job. and that building up sort of a, a robust sense of confidence. But what she did was she uh, approached the SLT and had a discussion with them about it. Oh. Um, because we, we know, don't we, and uh, people in leadership positions know that and we sometimes forget that even if we're not wrapped up with status and we, we're humble and we do our work alongside colleagues and, and, and these types of approaches, uh, if, if you work with me, Andrew, and I'm a head teacher, and you and I have a great relationship, and then you come in one day and you say to me, um, hi, Tim, and I say, hi, Andrew, how are you? And we always have a good morning chat. And then one day you come in and say, morning, Tim, and I nod and I walk by. Immediately your well-being becomes fragile. You think, what have I done? How have I upset him? Uh, these types of things. Now, if I know that you're busy and I can find out, what we have to do is manage the sort of free-floating anxiety around that. So, yeah, I, I can see you. Do you need me to stop? No, no, I, I, we're getting so many questions in, with so many okay, questions okay. in, and all of these answers are worth, are worth listening to. Can I, can I just um, say, what the teacher found out was that by explicitly talking as a whole school about we are aware that this impacts on well-being, uh, then they altered that difficulty. Right. Okay. Yep. Again, it's that self-awareness bit again. Um, I've got one more then, Tim. This is this is a really intriguing one as well. Uh, I love firing firing these at you, Tim, because you've no idea what's coming. <laughs> so, uh, does does Tim have any advice? on changing student and teacher inner narrative for the better a lot happens because of the emotional input and relationship building but apart from building trust are there any quick wins in terms of the teacher in a changing student and teacher inner narrative okay well you wouldn't say this so i'm going to say it. i need to get your your inner in a storybook <laughs> well it, um so there's uh, well it's, wow this is a long answer really but i guess but one of the things is to be conscious yes. uh, rather than unconscious really uh, to be conscious so for example in terms of pupil uh, in a narrative um well my view this is a very personal view um i think as uh marketization as uh, and competition uh, mm. has shut down mm. creativity and cross mm. collaboration and these sorts of things mm. um cognition and i'm a, I'm a psychologist of course i think cognition is important but Cognition has sort of emerged as a key and emotional social factors around learning have, some, have dropped back and taken the back seat a little bit sometimes. And I think that we need to be aware that for all of us, and in particular for some young people and their narratives about who they are and who they think they are, that as soon as we start learning, we, are, we become emotionally at risk. I don't know any um, uh, colleagues, adults on here, remember what it was like when you learned to drive. Uh, and cognitively, you'd learnt it all, and then someone turned the radio on, and it all fell apart. You didn't know what to do, yeah. um, or you learn that you, you're an adult who chooses to learn a musical instrument, and instantly you feel like an, you're infantilized. You can't do it. You're apologising. You feel uh, uncomfortable. Um, it's to be aware, I think, that when people are learning, there is always emotions at play and to articulate that in fact one of the projects we did through ucl was about talking to very young children about saying we're going to do a task now and emotionally this is what it might feel like it's okay to feel it's hard and if you feel it's hard this is what you do 
And some people, when they do wow. this, they might feel, I can't do it. And in terms of, you know, we've got cognitive scaffolding, everyone knows about that, but almost like emotional scaffolding, really, helping people understand that. So, because you, uh, I hate to say this, because it put add pressure, but if you look at the research of people like Holmes, who certainly in primary school says, teachers have over a thousand interactions with pupils per day. And every single interaction matters in terms of how I construct in the narrative inside my head. So it's being conscious about um, what it feels like to be them and being conscious about what it means to be you as the teacher because teachers psychologically engage with their work. How you feel affects me. It's why uh, in some of our work, teachers talk about their well-being uh, being low in their terminology not related directly to their job, but they work in environments where um, families need food banks, uh, need to use food banks, and uh, families struggle, and, uh, and some dreadful things happen in relation to safeguarding. And that sort of external happening out here that impacts me inside. That's fascinating, Tim. So much we every time you answer, we could have a really long discussion about each answer. Can we? So I'm being very self, I'm being very self-disciplined. I've got one final question, and this is a toughie actually uh, because it's going to require a fairly short answer, but it's a big one. So, and it's simply this: What are the top three things heads can do now? That's it. So I'm assuming it's within the context of this conversation. Um, within, within the context of well-being. Well, I'm assuming so. The question is, what are the top three things heads can do now? So I'm assuming it would, it would be... It's not a question from you. It's a question that's just come in. It's a que another, These, these oh, okay. are questions that are just coming in. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. So, uh, yeah. okay. So l l let's start with one. So one I would say is that remember that self-care and self-compassion is not selfishness. Yes. Yes. So you need to, you need to remember, <laughs> you need to look after yourself and that because the tendency uh, psychologically, particularly for leaders, is to try to meet everybody's needs and then ignore your own. Um, so that would be one thing in terms of well-being. Another thing I would say is find out what well-being means in your school. Find it out, talk to people about it, find out what it is. Um, and another thing, uh, be optimistic and believe that environments and people can change for the better. Wow. Wow. This is being recorded, everybody. So if, like me, you didn't have a pen and paper when you heard that, you can, uh, you can replay this and pick this up. Tim, it has been such a world... It's been so quick, to be honest, um, but that's because it's been so insightful. I've had the luxury of seeing um, Tim's reading materials and the modules and so forth that we put together in his unique wellbeing programme for Pathway. It's got really highly engaging films, incredible thought leadership pieces, lots and lots of coaching questions all the way through. And, uh, and typical, I think, perhaps from, from, the, from what I know of Tim now, it's absolutely about the quality of your own investment in yourself and your own responses to the reflections. It's not a masterclass because that isn't your style, Tim. Um, but my goodness, it's so insightful as it has been today. So I'm really sorry to have to draw this to a close so quickly, but I really appreciate your time, Tim. Can I thank you for the invitation and wish everybody well? Of course, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah. very much. And uh, can't wait to see you again soon. Can't wait yeah. to see you again soon. Thank you ever so much, Tim. Thanks. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Um, we could go on and on. Professor Tim O'Brien is, um, is, is, is in such a unique position to create the, uh, the wellbeing program for Pathway. And I've seen it, and it's, uh, yeah, I've never read anything like it. It's because it's, it's about you, it's about the reader, and it's very insightful and it's very upskilling in terms of what you actually need to do.